Well, thank you for having me. And I did prepare just a, a very short uh, presentation to just go into some of the science. Uh, and particularly for those who may not be familiar with my work, I've been working on agricultural burning in the US since uh, I was a graduate student in 2004. I have developed methods uh, under various NASA projects in working with the US Environmental Protection Agency uh, to map, monitor, and estimate agricultural burning emissions, including a field campaign in the Everglades agricultural area. These methods that I have published through scientific peer review are still used by the US EPA for the National Emissions Inventory and the Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And one of the reasons I work in this area, both domestically and internationally, is that I grew up on a farm um, in eastern Kentucky, and we had a very small tobacco base, which meant that when the tobacco settlement occurred, um, one of the downsides was that small and family farms were the uh, first farms impacted, and that actually delayed uh, my parents' retirement uh, for quite some time because we lost that income. And so the science I do, I'm always very uh, empathic and also just noticing the impact of farming practices on the rural populations, on our communities of color, our indigenous communities, uh, Latino and Hispanic and Asian American communities, and also our farming communities. So um, know that I'm coming from a place of, I, I do understand that there are often um, these balances that, that need to be um, considered. Oh, so let's start first with um, the Everglades agricultural area. Uh, approximately 400,000 acres of sugarcane is burned on average each year, and that is according to the state of Florida's own permitting system. This shows a recent Landsat satellite imagery that was captured by the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center from the 5th of January of this year, where you can see active burning. Now, of course, you all know that in the center it's Bell Glade. Um, but these fires, while they may seem small in comparison to wildfires, the smoke that they produce um, is in fact uh, harmful and causes regional air quality impacts uh, for all of the communities um, around the EAA and in South Florida. A study that was done at Florida International University um, about 10 years ago found that there are actually elevated levels of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. I know that's a mouthful. Um, these are carcinogenic um, emissions and they are 15 times higher during the sugarcane burning period um, than they are during the regular part of the year. In this smoke you will also find benzene and formaldehyde. That's right, formaldehyde. Um, and I know that because I am a co-investigator for the NOAA NASA FireX AQ uh, field team. And one of the things we did in the summer of 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, was fly a billion dollar plane full of equipment through smoke from agricultural burning throughout the Southeast. Though, unfortunately, we weren't able to capture sugarcane burning. We do have previous samples. Um, in Bell Glade, of course, there has been this US sugar air quality report. Um, these uh, images were uh, taken on the ground. Uh, some of the work that I'm presenting to you today is from a recent collaboration with Sierra Club, but I continue my federally funded and open source transparent federal uh, science research with NASA and EPA. I, I wanna point this out because with one single air quality MET sensor, as you can see in the lower right map from Google Earth, this is not really adequate uh, to understand the regional impacts. Uh, for instance, if we look at what U.S. Sugar reported and compare the days where their sensor actually, uh, did, where the sensor, sorry, did not actually report any values. So this happens occasionally if you have a single sensor and not a regional system and network. Um, these days were actually monitored by NOAA and their hazard mapping product as being um, high smoke days with plumes that were coincident, that means smoke overhead that should have been detected by the sensor or smoke nearby. Um, and so when you have missing dates like this because you have a single sensor and only one community, you're not adequately representing the particulate uh, matter, the particulate pollution uh, that you may find um, during this period. 
It should also be noted that I started studying this region and working um, with this, this data in 2004. And at that time, the Florida Agricultural Extension Service noted that sugarcane burning really occurred between the months of November and March. Uh, but since then, that has expanded. And now burning can occur as early as late August or early September and go on through May, which in essence means you only have a one season where these fires are not present. These maps were generated using the NOAA hazard mapping system. This is their daily smoke product. It is open source. It is both created through um, autom semi-automated um, algorithms of satellite information from geostationary satellite products. So every 15 minutes, the smoke is monitored. And also um, highly trained and specialized NOAA analysts um, delineate these smoke plumes as well. These are missing dates uh, from the sensor. And as you can see, in all three of these missing dates, there would have been um, at least one, if not two, uh, smoke plumes. And because there is this very like highly diverse and ever-changing dynamic uh, lower atmosphere, the winds of South Florida because of the coastal uh, region, the smoke plumes do not travel in a systematic way. And so having a sensor in only one location means that you're likely never going to capture the full impact of the smoke and the particulate pollution because the winds are so variable and can impact so many communities. It should also be noted that sugarcane burning can create regional haze events. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, this shows an event um, from October 20th, um, I'm sorry, October 2019. Uh, um, and what is happening here is that there's so much burning and smoke in the lower atmosphere that in fact, most of the EAA is being detected as having a regional um, haze or smoke alert. Um, this is similar to what you would see during a wildfire in the Western US. Um, but while there's only one plume, as you can see in the lower map, that is over top of the Bell Glade air quality sensor, the entire region is actually shrouded um, in smoke. And so why do we care about particulate matter 2.5 emissions? Well, particulate matter 2.5 is a very fine particle and it is known to pierce very deep um, into our lungs. And what that means is that it can exacerbate uh, chronic lung conditions like asthma and COPD. So that's why it was first monitored by the US EPA in their national ambient air quality standards, as well as monitored through the EPA national emissions inventory. If we just take the four public um, data points from the, the four counties that make up the Everglades agricultural area and then compare it to satellite detections only of sugar harvesting from 2019 to 2020 and then apply um, a radius around all of the communities in and on the edges of the EAA, what you will find is that um, at this very bottom row, and this is all in tons, is that within 10 miles of all of these communities, about 60% of the burning is occurring. And that means 60% of the emissions are occurring. So the communities of the EAA, and we'll hear from really the experts on the ground pretty soon, um, they are experiencing high levels of particulate matter um, and PM 2.5 emissions just within 10 miles of their homes and communities. Um, and, and so by Allowing unregulated or, unper or in this case, this is permitted burning, um, but without consideration of air quality and public health impacts, um, you really are impacting these human communities. Um, fire is a tool that's used by farmers and land managers, but if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and so we know that there are other alternatives to burning in all agricultural systems, um, not just sugarcane but there are many profitable and high yield alternatives to burning and sugarcane that have been implemented in, in other countries. Um, and uh, you know, the time is nigh uh, to try to implement those here, um, especially as the evidence points towards really detrimental public health impacts from sugarcane burning. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. If I have any time, I can take a couple questions. If not, Representative Hardy and uh, Ms. Unger um, have my email. I do work at Miami University of Ohio. I am a public university employee. 
So anyone is, is uh, welcome to email me to ask me about these research results. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. McCarty. And, and um, she, she does have to go, but if, if you would like to ask a quick question or two of her, I think she just said that would be um, okay. So if, 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 if a member of the press um, needs to be unmuted right now, um, you know, you can raise your hand here or, or um, you know, put something in the chat uh, and, and she'll get with you. Hi, Jessica, it's Wilkin Brutus with WLRN, South Florida's NPR station. Uh, have you had direct conversations with U.S. Sugar about some of your findings? I have not had direct conversations with them. I have read their published report and so far it seems to be filtered through other journalists and I would like to actually have a direct conversation with them. I think they could improve their monitoring um, and particularly through the type of sensor they're using, which is a really good scientific grade sensor, but it's not a regulatory one, which means that it can't be used as say evidence of um, sustaining uh, good, good quality air, according to the National Amb Ambient Air Quality Standards. Uh, and so it, it would be interesting actually to, to talk to them about how they plan to monitor this. And there's also some really innovative, innovative wearable tech that their employees um, and sugar farmers could be wearing um, so that they have a better idea of um, the impact of this air quality on them. Um, and this has really been developed, you know, over the last couple decades working with wildland firefighters, but smoke exposure is smoke exposure. Um, and so it would be helpful for the people working in sugar to also know uh, how it's impacting them too, in addition to the communities. And one more question. During my interview with U.S. Sugar, I've asked them about um, alternatives, and you've clearly here mentioned many profitable high yield alternatives, um, uh, such, such as green harvesting, for example. Um, do you think they could implement that? And what, what are your thoughts on uh, the way in which they could perhaps say they couldn't implement it? I do think that they could implement it. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, but I do think that, um, and I also think that Florida Agricultural Extension Service is a good extension service and they're more than capable with helping farmers do this transition and helping growers do this transition. Um, it would take a little bit of time and one could imagine that um, they'll have to reassess maybe some of their inputs initially. And what I mean by that is, uh, they may find actually they need less fertilizer because green harvesting uh, is highly correlated with, with needing to have less fertilizer, but they may need just a, a little more um, uh, herbicides um, and, and that would need to be, you know, addressed. Um, and, but it's possible. There's also a lot of demand <laughs> for the actual biomass, the trash leaves. Um, on the sugar itself, um, not only for, you know, compostable flatware um, and, and textiles, um, but, but bioplastics as I, well. I and just want to, yes, I think. Yep, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that Bruce Ritchie gets one question in, and that'll be the last one before we move on. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, doctor. Uh, the Florida Forestry Association was advocating for the bill a, a week or, or two ago. Do you think, and they're saying that this is very important for prescribed forest uh, burning. Do you uh, think that's the case? Does your research show anything in that? Direction? So I, I work a lot with tall timbers. I have colleagues there and I've worked a lot with prescribed burning and agroforestry and timber systems throughout the U.S. And so I think that it would behoove the state of Florida as in other states to maybe divorce these two things because prescribed burning and timber and agroforestry is something that's that um, is done in a way that actually produces less particulate matter emissions and less smoke um, than sugarcane burning. And by conflating the two, what you've, uh, what you've kind of done is um, married the, the need for prescribed fire for timber management and maintenance of invasive species in, in forest stands uh, versus you don't really need to burn sugar to harvest it. Yes, it's cheap and fast, uh, but it's not necessary and it's not necessarily the cheapest thing over a long, long term because it reduces your yield and your soil carbon. And with the peat soils in South Florida, they're actually reducing their own soil fertility by burning it. 
Um, and so I, I do understand where Florida timber and Florida agroforestry is coming from. It's just that it's not similar to agricultural burning and cropping systems. And so I believe people can walk and chew gum at the same time. So I think that they can also implement this nuance as well in the bill. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you.